Hi, Mark Antoine. Hey. Hey. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for uh, inviting me. To our talk. Uh, so it's a great honor to have you. I'll just do a brief introduction of myself. I'm Lucia, a student here at Le Wagon. Uh, I'm a grad of McGill University, and I've had uh, some previous work experience in multiple startups, uh, doing some online marketing and management information systems, and I'm going to be doing your interview for tonight. So first, uh, we'll do about 30 minutes of questions, and then we're going to let the audience ask you some questions as well afterwards. Perfect. So just to begin, can you introduce uh, yourself a little bit? Myself as a person. Um, whatever you feel yeah. is, is correct. So I'm Mark. Um, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here, by the way. Um, I always uh, love uh, keeping in touch with everyone uh, you know, working in a startup ecosystem. Uh, I've been actually doing companies and startups for more than 20 years. I mean, actually, I started this at 16. Um, I discovered completely accidentally that I was an entrepreneur because I didn't know that the word existed by the, by the time. Uh, it just seemed more obvious for me to do this type of thing than to go flip burgers or whatever. Um, so I am a, um, I'm a former musician, actually. My first career between 16 and 24 was to study uh, classical piano at the conservatory, and I also did a degree in, in musical composition. Um, I was also super excited by science, and by the time I said, okay, what, what am I going to do with this musical degree? Uh, am I going to do a PhD in, uh, you know, uh, to eventually become a teacher? I said, maybe I should look at other things. Um, and I, I went to Polytechnic, and I, I was trained as a computer engineer after this. So um, I'm kind of being the... Um, uh, I don't know, in, in this brain, I, I totally admit and, and embrace the fact that I am a super creative and also super, you know, uh, technical. Uh, but to pay those studies, I had to work, so I created companies. <laughs> so the first time I, I, I actually did this was to, uh, to help, you know, uh, lawn mowing and um, taking care of the uh, neighbor's uh, um, beautiful houses and it, it grew well so I had to hire my friends and then I lived all the growing pains of any companies which was purchasing new lawnmowers and hiring people and you know the folks didn't show up so I came back at home at 7 p.m. with a lot of voicemails people telling me that you know they weren't served so I got a lawn mow at 11 p.m. stuff like this so I basically learned my job in this way um, I had a uh, summer camp and day camp for eight years, which was uh, massively successful, and that helped me pay for all my studies. And in 2003, I, I, I self-coded with a couple of friends a, a software called Amelia now, uh, still in operation, and it was an online registration and payment platform for not-for-profit organizations. Uh, and the pain point was basically super simple. Nobody at that time was able to register online. Uh, back in the days, we are four years after the creation of Amazon, and people were actually lining up in, you know, um, non-for-profit community centers to, to register and to pay by check. And everybody was pissed off with the process, but nobody addressed that. So we decided to basically create a software that was helping non-for-profit to do this type of thing. And nobody would, wanted to pay for that because they said, we're a non-for-profit. We, we have volunteers. We, we don't have money to pay for your software. So we were really, really stuck for more than a year. We were running out of cash. We didn't know what was going on. I just had my first kid. Uh, for those two first years, I earned 5000 a year. And uh, we really were struggling. And then something came up. We discovered that the non-for-profit organizations registered from five to 20,000 people a year. But the, the real people that were pissed off with this were the parents. And we discovered that they were ready to pay five bucks to do this online instead of waiting in line for an hour, making a check. So we said, you know what? Community centers is going to be free for you. You enabled that. You let us work. And we printed money, literally, because 20,000 registration in 15 minutes at five bucks each is $100,000 in sales in an evening. So that was fun. And when we discovered that and we put it in place, uh, we said, now it's time to raise money. But guess what? 2003 in Montreal, I made all my roadshow 100% failure rate because no VC in Montreal wanted to fund this company. What for? They told me, nobody will ever fill a form online and pay by credit card. Ever. So it took us four years to get VC money. And we did this when we were massively profitable. So I learned my lesson, and uh, I decided to, you know, it, we grow the company. Now the company is 150 employees in, in Montreal, sold my shares, and I used this money to fund NetLift in 2012. And the great luxury was that 
when you do have a few uh, dollars in front of you to do this thing, you unrisk so many things. Uh, because you don't have external money, you don't need friends, family, whatever, to actually tweak what you need to do before raising capital. And uh, it's super, um, it's not easy. It's way easier to do these type of things on your own, if you can. Um, but the difference now is that every VC knows me in Montreal, so <laughs> it's, 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 it's a different story. So in a nutshell, this is, uh, this is where I come from. Wow, thank you. That was a great introduction. Um, actually, my first question was going to be about your education, because yeah. when, I, when I looked you up, I was like, whoa, this guy studied piano. Okay, that's, that's amazing. Um, so to start off with that, do you feel like studying classical music uh, helped you in your career as an um, entrepreneur or you know, businessman? Uh, and how do you maybe use those skills that you've learned mm -hmm. through your studies in your, in your life now? Well, there's two things. Um, classical music is like elite sports. It's extremely difficult on the discipline side. Um, you cannot master your art if you don't put a, 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 a whole lot of effort. And you don't, it, it's super competitive. I mean, I, I didn't make it as a pianist, uh, obviously. I was not good enough to make the career I wanted. That is why I switched. But it's basically um, learning how to work, how to fill an hour of work. And you can, you know, lose so much time. And uh, I, I learned how to work my schedule in music. Uh, I had a teacher who was extremely demanding. I had the same teacher with uh, Yannick Nézé-Séquin. We studied together. And when, what happened is that basically she said, you know what, when you, when you, you practice your piano, you, you take an hour, uh, you take 50, 50 minutes. And you put a timer. And for those 50 minutes, you are stuck on this bench. And you do one and one only thing. And you solve it. You have no right to go pee. You don't drink water. You don't answer the phone. You don't do anything else. You focus on this for 50 minutes. When it rings, you raise, you rest. Do your thought, 10 minutes, and then you go back. If you try it one day, I'm telling you, your life is going to be changed. Seriously, it's super difficult. Six hours like this is an output of two and a half days. And I'm not joking. You really can fill two and a half weeks in one week if you do this way, because you're super disciplined. You disconnect your you know, emails, your phone, whatever, because you're focused on one simple thing. So you can draft a complete business plan in three days. Because you have a, so much focus on this that it's... So I learned how to work doing classical piano. Second thing is, I also learned composition. And what, what was really a real challenge with these creators is that to, to learn how to compose, you, 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 the teachers put you a lot of constraints. So, for example, you only have, you know, a violin, um, a drum, and a piano. You have two and a half minutes. You have those intensities, those, those notes, and you have to go with this. I mean, the constraints are so big, you say, I'm not going to make something looking, sounding very well with this. Well, this is exactly how you build a startup. The constraints are extremely important. And if you embrace it, it works. But if you always complain about, oh, I don't have enough money, I don't have enough staff, whatever, it's never going to work. So. I regret it, I studied music for a while, but now I understand that I trust myself on my tuition using the same reflexes and, t uh, and, and tricks I learned in music. If I apply it in business, it, makes, it, it works very well. Wow, to, to be honest, now I want to go back and uh, study music and have a teacher that says, you can't go pee for 50 minutes. No, you can't. You I have think 10 that's minutes for doing this. I, I think that's what all millennials need right <laughs> now, right? We, sh we should make pee. an app for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, we know, as you've mentioned, of course, you worked in several companies. Uh, in a way, you're like a serial entrepreneur. You've launched, I know we were talking before, you said four companies. Yeah. Uh, you, you talked a bit uh, previously about your transition from one company to another. But would you say, overall, through your career, um, your multiple companies have been kind of like an addiction to solving problems? or? Uh, was there necessarily a pattern from one company to the next, or did it just kind of happen that you had opportunities? It, it was not just about companies, actually, because it, it is about um, solving things. When I was studying music, for example, there was a lot of problems in the faculty. Uh, first, there was no newspaper. I founded it because I said, look, there's no, we're, we're before the internet here, OK? So I'm, I'm getting old. Um, there was no orchestra that was able to play the composer's music. This was a problem, because back in the days, we only had those. I was the first one who owned, um, I used my, my student loan to purchase a MacBook back in 93. So I mean, we're talking 16 shades of gray here. <laughs> um, but I, I, I did music on this thing. And, and the point is, um, if there's a problem, you solve it. It's that simple. I mean, it, we need to make our music played. 
there's no orchestra, let's found it. I never ask myself, oh, maybe I should ask permission, or maybe I should see if there's something. I, no. For me, institutions are just as useless as it can get. You just go get your thing done. So I, I literally walked in the cafeteria in personally recruiting violinists and pianists, and I was harassing them until they said yes. And it worked. So I also discovered I was a good sales rep. But the point is not about I want to sell you something. I want to engage you something on a common goal. And if I'm doing a good job at it, usually it works. So I discovered that I was an entrepreneur because I didn't know back in the days that that could be used for companies. And a company could be for a, a, pro, a, for, a for profit, but it could be a not for profit. It could be a uh, foundation. It could be anything. At the end of the day, you focus on a problem you hate, you want to solve, and you get at it. And you find the right method. Sometimes it's about raising money. Sometimes it's about uh, organizing the team. It doesn't matter. It, it, it really is about how I'm going to solve this thing. And you get at it. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, well, like you've mentioned throughout your whole career, you've been solving problems. Can you name the biggest challenge that you've had, and uh, how did you overcome that? At, at, at solving problems? Oh, uh, no, just well, any sort of challenge. <laughs> All in the your problems I had. Okay, so the, let's the take another one. beer. Um, so look, I, I think um, the biggest challenge out there is never to to create the solution. Most of the solutions already exist out there. It's the adoption. It's very difficult for human beings to accept something that puts us in a risky situation. It's true for our relationships. It's true for experimenting something else. If I'm asking you, like we all go tonight at 11 p.m. at a very nice club in the second basement of a building I know, everybody's here is going to be say, what? Except for two or three people say, yes, let's go, OK? The society is about 3 to 5% of the population who will embrace risk, embrace disruption, and it's completely OK. Because those are the people who will make things change if they embrace it. Otherwise, they will be unhappy with their lives. I discovered I was this type of people, and I stopped fighting against this. I said, look, I'm a change agent, so let's, let's assume it, OK? But the biggest challenge is to make the other person on the other side of the table accept that. It could be a customer. It could be a partner. It could be investors. Um, you want to recruit a very good developer. That person is going to accept if he's between 17 and 23. But the day he has a loan, he has a mortgage, he has a kid, it's over. Security kicks in. And they really are willing to work in a startup if they will have a paid salary, insurance, and all this stuff. But he's very good. What do we do? He wants to have 20% of the business. It's always this, this thing. Okay, so I think that the biggest challenge up there is, is about making society accept change. It takes five years. Okay, so this is why when I founded Nutlift in 2012, I knew at that moment that I was not having a, a product ready in two years. It doesn't matter. I incorporate it and I go talk to customers right away. Why is that? They will take three to five years to just unfreeze. By the time they get there, we'll have a product, we'll have a solution. And it's happening right now. Perfect. Thank you. Well, it's funny you mentioned uh, the biggest challenge. One of them is to get a good developer. Uh, a bit of publicity for Le Wagon. You can go do the program, become a developer yourself. <laughs> it's done. I have my computer science <laughs> degree. There you go. Um, so, you know, you mentioned challenges in the workplace, uh, you know, in the industry. What about in your personal life? You know, being someone who's, who's working a lot, who's working a lot of projects, obviously investing a lot of time, and like you mentioned, not always having uh, especially at the beginning, a lot of financial resources for yourself. How do you balance your work and you know, your personal life? So I personally do live well with this, but I, I'm, I'm being extremely honest with you. It's, it's a grinder. Um, I have a, you know, the chance of, I met my wife in music. So she was as broke as I was back in the days. And we uh, went into, like we've been married for years now, but we went into life um, accepting that it could be a, a grinder. I have three kids. and. Uh, there was uh, some time where we literally uh, lived on hundreds of dollars a week, um, literally. Um, and it was super tough. But at the end of the day, it's about the bigger picture. 
and see how we create value. Um, I'm telling you that most of the startups fail because of that. Because at some point, one of their partner is making in his pants and he want to leave, like running. You got to be extremely open with your partners and with yourself about this. It is a, a very grinder. The chances of a, a, a failure are very high and it's not fun. It really is not fun. When you can't miss the mortgage payment because your company is out of, of cash, it's absolutely zero fun. I'm living well with this, but you got to be honest with yourself and uh, you got to make sure that you understand this before you jump into this type of thing. Because you don't need money when you start a company. You need money when you grow it. When you have to pay 500,000 a month in salaries, it becomes, a, it, it becomes material. You really have to think about it because at the end of the day, it's your name that's on the line. Until very recently, I was the only um, guarantee for the company, for, for the banks and everything. Nobody wants to, I mean, I'm talking VCs here. I'm talking about a couple of millions of dollars where I'm the, I'm, they're going to take my, my house for two million. I mean, wait a minute. So now I can do this, but at the very beginning, I remember when we raised money with Amelia, it was 100,000 in loan that we needed. But they didn't want to, you know, uh, grant us this money if we didn't have a capital and we needed 35,000. And, and we were students, so how, where do you find 35,000 in capital in Montreal? It was tough. So we made a big party, inviting all our friends, uncles, families, and we went for one and two and three thousand dollars, and people chipped in. And they all made a massive amount of profit with this, because three years later, we bought it back five times the investment. So they were super happy to say, I'm going to get it again, call me whenever you want. But the point is, it's about building your story. Um, most of the entrepreneurs, and I'm going to give you a tip here, a lot of entrepreneurs will look at a roadmap from a technical perspective. They have a, you know, my product will be from MVP to version 1.0, and then we'll add this feature. You understand what a roadmap is when you create a product. As entrepreneurs, you need to be able to demonstrate a roadmap of value. So I'm going to first do this on the first six months. At the end of those six months, I will have created something that were, it is worth $100,000. I do have a letter of intent for a big customer. I do have an MVP. I do have a partnership, blah, blah, blah. It's worth 100000 Then I will raise money for the next year to create $2 million value. Value is something that is objective. You, you can really go there and, and evaluate that. And if you're good at executing value creation, you're a good entrepreneur. Otherwise, it's just, I'm hoping for the best. Uh, nobody will follow that, including customers. Oh, those are really good tips. Um, you know, for a lot of us here from Le Wagon, we're interested in primarily web entrepreneurship, uh, you know, applications. Do you have any specific tips uh, for us, for people who are working specifically with the web and online? Um, or do you think uh, entrepreneurial advice is for everyone, is the same for everyone? Oh, oh it is. Uh, I mean. I'm, I'm telling, as a computer engineer, uh, technology is never a, uh, an obstacle. I never found a company that failed for technical reasons. The company failed for a lot of things, but not for that. Universities are filled with potential patents and solutions that don't fit a need. The real thing you need to tell me is what problem are you solving and what's the economical value of this solution. Otherwise, you have no business. I'm sorry, guys, but this is true. There's a lot of solutions that look for problems out there. What you really need to focus on, it could be the web being a solution. It could be a lot of other things. At the end of the day is what's, and if we walk outside and we take an hour together, we will identify dozens of problems. The, the, the society is full of problems everywhere. The idea is what's the value for them? I'm taking sometimes a, an, an image. I'm, I'm going to tell you it's the uh, Tylenol uh, problem. You know the Tylenol problem? What's the value of one Tylenol? Just one. I'm not talking about bottle here. Just one. Huh. 60 cents, maybe 25 cents, maybe 12. Doesn't really matter, right? But if you were trekking together on the woods for three days, super, you know, and then you're dying of headaches, and it's been a day, a nightmare, and then th th this little, you know, strumpf comes out of the woods and say, hey, I do have a Tylenol for you. It's 40 bucks. <laughs> you're taking it. I know you are. So it's not about... The thing itself, it's about the context, the economical value of the problem you're solving. If you don't have any headaches, it has no value. If you're dying, you're going to pay everything for that. Your deal is to find the economical value of the problem you're going to solve. And sometimes the solutions are massively simple. And if you fix it, you have a business. Otherwise, 
you're going to spin around for years and hoping for the best. It's not, move on, get to the next thing, right? I think uh, we could also tweak the Tylenol problem to coding all night long, right? Right, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh, well, you know, you're giving great advice. I, I'm, I'm fascinated. Uh, I think maybe one of the reasons is that you're a mentor at Inocité Montréal. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the organization and your role there? Yeah, so in, in Montreal, you do have a couple of uh, accelerators and incubators. I think we're about something like a dozen now. So you have Inocité, and you have Founder Fuel, and you have the CIM, and you have all these things, right? Um, at the end of the day, they are basically the ecosystem is trying to uh, filter um, all the, the people that would like to do some companies, and then they will, you know, put you on pressure for about a couple of months and see if you have something. The problem you're going to get is that the advice you will receive is always interested. A VC will tell you how to raise capital money without asking you if you need it. Um, a lawyer will come tell you, you know, what you, you need to know in order to structure your business without asking you what you're trying to achieve. So, basically, I'm I'm having no interest in this except for helping other entrepreneurs because I would have hoped to receive those things in the first hand, and I learned it the hard way. What I'm doing with Inocite, and I did it before, is only to fix your business model. I'm only doing one thing: the solution will follow, the recruitment will follow, the positioning, the marketing. These are means. What I'm going to try to find out, I'm going to give you a small example. I do a, every cohort, I do a two hours meetings uh, workshop with two slides. It's about your funnel. Ever heard of it? As a sales, you know, you have a funnel. So let's suppose that you've developed a, a new solution um, for, could be anything, and uh, you think you have a business. So I'm going to ask, you, okay, so what's your gizmo worth? I'm a customer, how much should I pay to, to, to and you're going to tell me, uh, it's 5,000 a year. Good. Let's suppose that it's great value for me, and we've gone through this. Five thousand, perfect. So I'm your target customer. I'm a you know small and medium business. Five thousand SaaS model, like it, great. So you want to make a million this year? Awesome, one million a year, good startup. Five thousand a piece. How many sales do you need? How many customers? Two hundred. Two hundred. Perfect. So you need to close one customer every business day. You need to close one customer every single business day, every eight hours of work, bing, 5,000. Another eight hours, bing, 5,000. Okay, great. How much meetings, emails, phone calls, propositions do you need to do this? Probably 12. Probably take three to five months, because it doesn't know from hell. You're a new kid on the block. I'm going to put you 5,000 on a couple of kids in a basement. Are you serious about that? You better be very good. Let's talk again. I want to be absolutely sure about that. Oh, I, I love your thing, but you know what? I do have a new board, so we have to go over a budget. Call me back in six months. And so over, and over I mean, I've been through this. So let's go through the funnel. You're going to close 10% of the proposition you're going to send out there. We know that. These are, you know, rule of thumbs for years of experience. So you need to send 2,000 proposals out there to, to sign 200. Those 2,000 people, if they receive a proposal, it's because they've heard about you. They met you. They talked to you. So you need to talk to about 20,000. Is there, there 20,000 prospects out there just for your business? How do you get to find them? You have no business. I'm sorry to say, you're going to make, you're going to fail. It just doesn't work this way. So. Let's go back to the business model. Maybe you should sell it 50,000 and just close 20. Because it's going to take you the exact same sales time, same meetings, same conferences, same proposals. Just 10 times less the work. Okay. This Bye. usually is not ending well. Because those meetings, they all smile be before I come in. And then after two hours, either they have a business or they don't. It's not fun. But I'm telling them, basically, I just save you a lot of years of pain, OK? And then we tweak it. So you probably know a company called Potluck. They're just, I think, in the next building. They fixed the model in my face during this thing. And they were selling $400 reports. And now they're selling $40,000 reports. And I'm on their board, because they're open France and Switzerland. Just like that, OK? Because for me, I told them, the value of this thing is much more than you expect, than you think it is. Because you're targeting the wrong customer. You're, selling, you're trying to sell $400 uh, 
reports to small and medium business that don't have any money, but the, the bank who's going to loan them a quarter million to open up a new restaurant is super risky. Why don't you sell this bank a 20,000 report that will make your deal work? You switch on the value, sa the value chain and just find money, right? The same way we did at Amelia. Nobody wanted to ask and to pay for our, for our solution, but we had, you know, 7,000 parents out there who were ready to pay five bucks to, well, okay, let's tweak the product. And in a week, you fix the product and it works. So you just need to com completely understand the value chain of your business model and fix, you know, where should I, where should I hit? Oh, so where do we sign up? <laughs> it's free. <laughs> uh, perfect. So, you know, we've talked about your business experience. Let's talk about NetLift. I want to know, how did you come up with this idea? Is it, does it come from a personal problem that you've encountered or was it kind of a solution that uh, someone else it, came it, up with? Or? No, it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, I, back in 2011, I was still CEO of, Net, of Amelia and I was looking at the news and I saw all those, you know, car con completely st st clogging the, the, the bridges and everything. I say, wait a minute, I mean, those cars are going nowhere. They're parked on the bridge, but they're all empty. The, what's the point of, you know, moving all those people along? Uh, you've heard this story before. And I wanted to understand why in the world nobody was able to tackle this type of thing. So I started looking a little bit at this, calling a couple of teachers and researchers around the globe and, you know, reading everything about this. And I understood that there's a, you know, a couple of things that make it impossible. Um, first off, everywhere in the world, in any big city in the world, the chances that your colleague is living in the same zip code and works on the same hours are 0.4%. So statistically, carpooling has no chance to work because of that. If you're, if you're going to just share the ride, it's not going to happen, right? So we said, okay, um, what else? 83% um, of the population that drives the car to work will never use another th system for a lot of reasons. Women, most of it, told us that security was a big issue. They didn't want to be standing for an hour you know, having people, you know, very close to them, especially in Latin America, some places in Europe, okay. They drive alone for security issues, perfect. A lot of people told us that they couldn't because they have kids and they have to leave their work at five, but they have to be at the kindergarten, daycare at six. So they have constraints that are way over any other type of solutions. And when the, the, the deeper we dig into this, the more complicated it became. But as I said before, there's a problem here. Let's try to see if we can fix it. So I decided to sell my shares with Amelia, and with this money, I funded the company. And I said, okay, I'm gonna pay PhDs to do research. I'm gonna do algorithmics with them, and we're gonna go try something. At the beginning, we were not clear about the business model, because the problem is transit is massively subsidized by the public sector. So the, the amount that somebody pays to take the metro is actually a third of the, what it really costs. Um, and if you're trying to do carpooling on long distances, you're basically competing against the train or the bus, which are super expensive. But when you're carpooling daily, uh, it's an uphill battle because everything else is cheaper. So why would people actually share a cost on something, right? Didn't work. And then if you do have a perfect match, are we going to travel together? I mean, you're, you're, you're seeing my face on a nap. <laughs> Not sure, right? Say, so, wait a minute. I mean, who's this guy? I mean, I don't know him. I'm going to share a, you know, a, a closed space for an hour. What are we going to talk about and everything? So, so the sociology of this is, is super complicated, OK? It's like Tinder, but on a daily basis. So I usually <laughs> try to avoid talking to my Uber drivers, so exactly. I understand. Exactly, yeah. So all those problems kicked in. And he said, wait a minute, there are solutions here. First, intermodality. If you go to Google Maps right now and you enter an origin and a destination, you have to select the modes, either car or bike or walk or transit, right? We built an algorithm that combined car and transit. What it means is that we know who the driver will take you. You don't need to share the whole distance, just a portion of it. So now in NetLift, most of our users share a common origin and completely different destination. We just need to drop somebody to the next metro station, bingo. We have a 25 times higher matching rate than any other competition, which leads to a 25, 25 times smaller critical mass. So that's one key element. But the second one was more difficult. How do you motivate a driver to daily pick someone up if it's illegal? Because remember, to be legal, carpooling cannot make a profit. This is the whole Uber situation we had around the globe. We tried for a couple of years to just 
tweak the amount based on a kilometer base, but let's say that we travel 10 kilometers together and we stuck an hour in traffic, literally you're going to do, we're going to spend an hour together for two bucks. Are we serious about that? No. Nobody is doing it ever anywhere in the world. So we kind of, you know, grind something and it was not working and I was upset. And then we talked to people. I literally picked the phone and called everyone. Why did you refuse it? Wait, I'm the boss of this company. You had a match. He said yes. You said no. Why? It's like the, like the boss of Tinder calling people. <laughs> Why did you reject this guy? He said, he's ugly. I don't want to talk to him. But I wanted to understand that. And they said, you know what? It's a bit difficult because he's picking me up like seven minutes early and I'm not necessarily ready. I'm not sure about this person and everything. And we discovered that the real motivation for drivers was parking. People, I mean, if you look at an Uber driver, his life is to circle around as much as he could. So an Uber driver, a taxi driver, never parks. A bus, a train, a metro never parks. The business case is to drive as much as they could. A commuter goes from a parking to another parking as fast as he can. The, the very you know, meaning of this use case is spe specifically not to travel. It has to be faster, as fast as possible. So we discovered that commuting is not a transportation ecosystem. It's a real estate ecosystem. People are ready to pay if they are brought from home to work at a reasonable price. And the drivers, now this is what we tested, we discovered that there's no chance for carpooling of succeeding on, on, on business hours if the parking is free. But when parking is expensive, people are killing because we offer them a free parking spot in downtown Montreal. There's one condition, you need to bring someone with you and it has to be in the app. What we solve here, retention. If we get on together and say, hey, let's leave NetLive because they take 30%, no, 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 you can leave. You lose your parking. Good luck with the rest. So you're switching from a free parking guaranteed by NetLift to a 400 parking in downtown Montreal if you find one. So we literally give you 4,000 back a year and you just have to drive somebody your route. When we discovered that, we discovered that we're not a transportation company. We're a real estate company. And because of that, we are very close of having much more drivers than Uber in Montreal like that because we have 1.45 million people driving every morning in Montreal and there's 1,300 drivers in Uber. More than half of it are taxi drivers. So the capacities don't kick in. So when we discovered those type of things, we just found a new business model and this is what investors saw and the aha moment was that because they told us basically like the model is 50 times bigger than, than Uber. And Uber is a cool startup, right? It, it's not bad. It is. Yeah. I think it's the most valued yeah, private exactly. company in the world. So now we raise money to execute that on a larger scale. Wow. Yeah. Uh, as someone who, who spent about a month trying to look for parking in my building, <laughs> like this summer, I, I understand your struggle. Um, actually, you mentioned something interesting. Like on a personal level, you said women don't want to necessarily, you know, yeah. take public transport. There, people might be creepy. Uh, do you? How do you solve that problem with NetLift? You know. I, do I really want to spend a, an hour with yeah, a so strange dude? It, it really is about um, getting, to, getting along together with people. So um, right now, drivers and riders have to accept each other. So when you request a ride, you'll get some matches eventually. If you're doing this on a, you know, if you're working at midnight in the middle of a nowhere, probably you'll have no match. But if you do have some matches, you'll have to select, and the other parties have to select as well. So at least people will accept each other. Um, obviously. And we had this. A guy was a super gentleman, very, you know, he wanted to help, he wanted to, and he was always rejected. So he called us, said, I don't understand exactly what, I'm doing compromise, I leave later. And so we asked the, the other parties, women and girls, and the, uh, it was basically a racist reason. They didn't name it this way, but we understood behind the words that his name, his profile, his looks was a problem. So we have to address that and we have no clue yet how we're going to do this because it's very sensible, okay? The point is, um, it goes both ways. We do have uh, young moms who create some sort of clubs on Netlift trying to help each other. Um, they all look a bit, I mean, they have muffin and cookies on the back bench and everything. They have kids and they understand each other, so it, get, it goes well. And if you're a, you know, neo-Gothic, heavy metal, hardcore, Dungeon and Dragons player, you probably will be matched with folks like this. And you're going to be okay to go, I mean, I don't know, 10 minutes later to be with this kind of guy instead of having the perfect match and being like a geek or, you know, a political nerd, whatever. So we discovered that people are ready to make some flexibility in their commute schedule if they are to have a good experience with this. So perfect, we're trying to blend 
um, an artificial intelligence and recognizing the patterns to make sure that we do good recommendations. If I do have 50 matches for you, what will be the two, three, four, maybe I'm going to try to find people your age, your lifestyle, your interests. So at least you're not going to fight over the music uh, on the next morning. Mm -hmm. But this is a next, this is the part of the next research we're going to do. So it's like Tinder, but Tinder for, for commuters. Carpooling. It has to be exactly. this. Yeah. Well, actually, I know I think um, you probably know the company BlaBlaCar in Europe. I'm quite sure they have a, like a women's only option. So maybe it's something you could consider. Mm -hmm. uh, We've been asked this in Mexico City, by the way. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, we're talking a lot about the human factor, how carpooling, it's, it's not just, you know, oh, you get in the car, someone else gets in the car. It's, it's really about having a connection with someone else. I think that maybe we discussed Uber a little bit. That's uh, a selling point for them is that whenever I get into an Uber, I feel like it's more of a real person kind of driving me, maybe someone who could be my neighbor rather than, I feel like when we get into a taxi, we see it a little bit differently. Yeah. There's, there's that human factor. Uh, I know Netlift, Netlift is starting to work with, with taxi companies and integrating taxis into a part of their service. How will you tackle this sort of human factor problem um, with people using taxis mm -hmm. instead, of, instead of, let's say, carpooling? That's a very good point. Um, obviously, we're not here to, to save the taxi industry from itself because there's a lot of stupid people there. Um, <laughs> and, and trust me, we've been working on this. We've hired the, the former VP of uh, our new VP is a former head of, of, of the Bureau of Taxi of Montreal. The point is that um, some taxi drivers are super good guys, and they've been extremely uh, underserved by their typical taxi companies. So most of the folks told us that it's not about the car I'm using, it's not about the driver, it's about the experience. Um, if we can turn you know, a, a working dad into a you know, competent and sympathetic dude, why not? Because I found, you know, very stupid Uber drivers as well. But the point is, we want you as a customer to have a 100% guarantee that you're going to have an affordable and dedicated ride if you want to go somewhere. If you're not able to plan something, the, 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 what's, what, I, what I do love a, a lot about Uber is that when you press a button, in two minutes you have some, something picking you up and driving you whatever you want. Um, so that's great. We're not trying to do this, right? Uber is doing this very well. We're trying to help you be on time with your next meeting, which is super important for you, at an affordable price. And eventually consider that you can subscribe to this. Um, so you might not have always the same uh, taxi driver, but you would sometimes get a taxi cab, sometimes you're going to get a carpooler. At the end of the day, we want you to feel comfortable with a type of service. And if you don't like this driver, you're telling us. And if he's not doing a good job, he's out. Okay, so we want to create a meritocracy in taxi that was not the case, not because of the drivers, because of the companies that are the middlemen between this. And hopefully, we'll get to a point where the whole industry will re think about itself. We, we think we have a good cut at it because the driver is actually making more with us than with Uber for less for the customer because of new business model. Mm -hmm. Oh, perfect. Um, well, you know. I don't feel I answered correctly your answer. Though. No, no, no. I think I think question. he I think he yeah. did in a way that uh, you know, as much as there's that human factor, at the end of the day, if you have a meeting, yeah. you want to go to your meeting. If you can go to your meeting for ten bucks uh, via Netlift versus thirty or forty with an Uber, you know, I don't mind paying ten. Obviously, um, I have a more of a personal question. Okay. Do Do you yourself use your app? I to, do. to get around? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, most of the, as, as much as I could. Um, usually what I do, uh, when I do work, go to work, I, I, I drop my kids at school. And from there, I am a driver, uh, where, which I offer uh, drives all the way down to work. And I'm super flexible trying to help people. So when I do have matches, I usually say yes. Um, and when I'm at work and I do have to go uh, around places, uh, hopefully November 20th I will be using Uber and uh, Netlift all the time. Mm. Uh, now I'm using Uber a lot <laughs> for, yeah. for these type of things. Um, but I'm trying everything because basically I want to make, make, make sure that I experience everything um, from TO to Uber to taxis to everything. When I travel, I'm trying, like in Mexico City, you have Cabify, you have Taxify, it's, you have Carrot, which is a, it's, it's a car sharing company. So I'm trying to experience all the modes of transportation and see how it feels basically to, because that what we're trying to achieve is to make people leave their car at home if they can not avoid it to go to work. But obviously sometimes they need it because they have families, they have a hockey practice on Saturdays. If you try to do groceries or go to Ikea on a bus, good luck. I mean, cars are here to stay and, and, and it should. 
uh, because it, it is you know flexible and everything but it has to be used differently uh, on, on peak scenarios mm -hmm. so so do you tell people when, when you like pick them up uh, you know when they ask what do you do <laughs> Sometimes, well, they already know it because I, it's it's written in Netflix C or on this, so I I, I cannot That's not you know intimidating, right? I cannot uh, and if you Google my name right now in Google, it's difficult for me to hide from what I am. So okay, but everybody does it, by the way. If I'm seeing your name, everybody goes on Google, look at this, and say, hmm, it looks like a nice girl. Okay, I'm gonna say yes. So it's it's exactly this way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know, we're talking a lot about how the company is changing a little bit. You know, at first you had you saw one way, and then you had to really define your clear vision and now you're adding some new features. What kind of vision do you see for the company in the next little while, maybe the next three to five years? Uh, maybe new additions, new partnerships? So three to five years is a very, very long time. Uh, what I can tell you that uh, in the next 12 months, we should be up and running in at least Mexico City because it's signed. Uh, they expect us to deliver between 200 and 5,000 rides a day. Um, so it's a very big bite for us. It, we've been preparing this for two years, but now it's signed up. Uh, we are definitely looking for opening a new metropolitan areas in North America and Europe. Don't know exactly what we have a short list, but I think that in 24 to 36 months we should be operating in, in about a dozen metropolitan areas in the world, probably kicking something like, uh, mm -hmm. I would guess, uh, half a billion in sales a year. Not Ballpark. too bad. Yeah. I won't mind if my startup made that much. Um, so you know, with with all these things you're mentioning, you you definitely need a good team. Uh, and you know, us at Levago right now, we're learning to work in teams. We're for our last two weeks, uh, we're going to be actually working on an app in, in small teams. How did you find the right team uh, for this project? Super good question. So um, I, I did co-found it with uh, Guillaume. Uh, he's a, a you know, he was a friend, and uh, we studied together at Polytechnic. This is a type of once in a lifetime geek that you actually make. This guy is like. Um, basically, when he get bored on Saturdays, he helps Nest to debug his API. And he did, it's literally, um, before they were bought. Um, he was the first purchaser of the Nissan Leaf in Quebec. He make, put his name on a waiting list. The product was not even ready. So three years before, when, when it was released, they called Nissan Japan called him and said, it's going to be ready, perfect. So he literally you know, went there with a the family and paid it cash because he, he saved his money to, to this type of thing. Um, he got born on a Saturday, and he created a, uh, with an, you know, an, an iPad um, he created a dashboard for his house, and he knows in real time the energy consumption of every single piece of it. So the type of guy, right? So basically what was really fun with this type of guy is that he said, look, I don't want to put money in this company. That's your job, but I'm going to make it work. And he literally built everything from ground up, from the back end, the payment system and everything. The guy has an output, uh, because right, the way I manage and hire people is about output. It's not about hours worked. Remember the piano thing? Mm -hmm. I want to know what you can give me in an hour or in a week. And if you give me twice as much, I'm going to pay you twice as much. It's not about the salary. It's about the output. Okay. So it, what takes Guillaume four hours is usually taking a week for a regular dev. And if he makes it in a week, he has a job. But he's doing it in four hours. So I gave him a, an interesting chunk of the company because he was worth it. And he, he's really delivering it. So, and after this, we tried a couple of things. We, uh, we hired folks to do some things. My job is to give a very specific brief. I need to be super clear about what I expect about everyone. And it's not about, I want you to be on time at work. I want you to work hard. No. I want you to give on this desk in 30 days that document. You have 30 days. And then it's delivered. Cool. Next. So our team works on a eight weeks uh, period, everybody has to, to 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 divide his work in a, in eight weeks, and it has a, it, to to be a very simple and measurable objective. It has to be difficult, and it has to be so. We're very hard when we hire, basically. Especially Guillaume is very tough. He's, he he fires basically 75 percent of people he hires in less than a month, and to be hired, he has to make a test that he built himself on the web. So it's impossible to crack. You can't Google the questions. He will discover it. So it's 4% uh, of the developers passed it to the interview. So he's, he's making it tough. So I guess I, I shouldn't ask if you're hiring. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we are always hiring. Uh, we're always looking for talent. But it's just that we've created an ecosystem where we have much less people. We have it in, uh, 17 people 
team that outputs for about 50. We know that because we made comparison. So, so it's very good from a payroll perspective. But it's just, for example, our CMO has a has run an agency for for 12 years, and he's literally doing the marketing stuff himself. Mm -hmm. So, this is the type of folks. Um, otherwise, it's I'm not saying some jobs are okay to to go there, but for my my core team, I need to have this type of people because it's too difficult otherwise to train people and explain. And then if you raise money, as a, I convert capital into value creation. So I need to be able to boil it down to my board and my investors. If I put you know, 100 or 150 a year in that uh, person, he's going to create like 2 million value after it. But I, I need to be able to demonstrate I that. Guess, I guess that's why you have uh, maybe half a billion profit soon. We'll see. <laughs> well, we'll hopefully. See. We have to execute. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Um, so I think we're going to move on to, to the audience to the questions. Audience. But uh, sure. just as a last, as a last yeah. word, uh, if you have any kind of advice what if in one sentence you give advice to aspiring entrepreneurs or business owners well f first off don't do it alone uh, it's uh, basically impossible to make it alone because there's too much things my my favorite number is three um, because it's very stable try to surround yourself with people that are completely different than yourself uh, Guillaume I, I, I was saying my, my former my, 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 my co-founder is, uh, is is my complete opposite he hates to talk he uh, he hates he hates marketing and sales. He's he's for, for him it's completely useless. Um, the real reason he wakes in the morning is if there's a itch to scratch. If and I motivate him with the hardest, dirtiest technical problems ever. If it's too simple, he's just going to give it away to someone else. So I never found something that he was not accepting as a challenge. So and and uh, and all the team is working in this direction exactly. So it's super motivating. So I strongly suggest that you are two, three would be best, and that those three people are super different, yet respectful to each other. If you're pay, playing in the goals, you're not expected to score, but if you if you don't stop the pucks, you're going to get fired. So try to be, I mean, it's your company. You, you Try to be as, think of it as a rock band. If you're a very good drummer and you expect of having success on music, you cannot have it, you know, a, a, a bass guitar player that's under par. Be super, you know, expecting the best for everyone, because at the end of the day, what's going to happen is that um, I personally think that I'm the most incompetent guy in the room when I'm with my team. Seriously, I really admire those people. I'm super lucky. I'm afraid to meet the rest of them. <laughs> no, no, no. But it's, it's just that they're they're all very, very good at it, and um, and I feel privileged to work with these people because I say, gosh, how can I actually? successfully recruited those folks. It's no difference than the orchestra I was talking before, right? So surround yourself very well. Be extremely clear and simple about the goal you want to achieve. If the goal, the methods have changed over the years, but not the goal. I want to remove cars from the road without compromising the commuting experience. That's it. That's one goal. It, it's, it's not going to change. We're going to go all the way down this route. So if the goal doesn't change, the problem to solve is super crisp. You have a, a, an economical value of this. Put your head down and work. It's, it's going to work 100%. It's that simple. Money will come. Customers will come because they will look at you. I mean, we failed miserably a few times with our models. But people said, you know what? As a startup, it's OK to fail. So go ahead. Keep doing it. And, and investors are patient. Customers are patient. They will forgive you. You're trying very hard, and they will, you know, you don't cure cancer on a, on a, you know, on, on a startup like this. Some problems are very difficult to solve. Go for it. But it should not fail that much if you, if you go with those little things here. Mm -hmm. My two cents. Perfect. No, that, that's perfect. Thank you.